I do not join in the belief that the African is our equal in brain or in heart. And I believe that if we can, in any fair way, possess ourselves of his services, we have an equal right to utilize them to our advantage. Francis Galton, 1857. Francis Galton is known as the father of eugenics. He actually coined the phrase eugenics. So he believed in trying to increase those he felt were superior in stock and decrease those he felt were inferior. Francis Galton came from a very wealthy family, a family that made its wealth from the slave trade. And what a lot of people don't know is that Francis Galton was a cousin to Charles Darwin. Francis Galton took Charles Darwin's philosophies and ideas and thoughts and he actually put them into practice and that's what we know today as eugenics. Eugenics and evolution are related in that they both see what they consider to be the um, highest form of primate, such as the gorilla, as almost indistinguishable from what they consider the lowest form of human, the African and the Aborigine. In the early 20th century, the white elitists who made up the eugenics movement were no longer just philosophers and academics. Now they were industrialists and billionaires who had come to embrace a worldview that was essentially identical to the eugenics movement. The same individuals and corporations who had once made millions on the backs of slaves were now willing to spend millions to get rid of them. But that didn't mean that these guys were interested in being public crusaders for the eugenics movement. They were certainly willing to be the brains and the money behind it, but they would hire crusaders to do the dirty work. And the primary one they settled upon was a woman named Margaret Sanger. She was the founder of the American Birth Control League and the publisher of its newsletter, The Birth Control Review. Eugenics goals are most likely attained under a name other than eugenics. Frederick Osborne, president and founding member of the American Eugenics Society. By the late 1930s and early 1940s, revelations about Nazi and fascist atrocities in Europe were causing the public to become increasingly uncomfortable with terms like eugenics and population control. Marketing research had shown them that in this environment, they needed to move away from words like control in favor of less threatening words like planning. So in 1942, they changed the name of the organization. From then on, the American Birth Control League would officially be known as Planned Parenthood. The important thing to understand here is that this name change did not change the organization's agenda. The same people were still in control, they were still obsessed with race, and they were still dedicated to eugenics. From its beginning, Planned Parenthood always had powerful ties to the American eugenics community. In fact, in many places they were often one and the same. For example, when the first birth control clinic was opened in Arkansas, it was operated by the Arkansas Eugenics Association and overseen by a woman named Hilda Cornish. Later, the Arkansas Eugenics Association would become the Arkansas State Affiliate of Planned Parenthood, and Cornish would be named its executive director. The other reality was that an increasing number of African Americans were becoming suspicious that a hidden agenda was behind the birth control revolution. Even those who once supported the idea of population control were beginning to sense that it actually meant black population control. This feeling was evident in June of 1970 when the Black Caucus walked out of the first National Congress on Optimum Population and Environment being held in Chicago. Felton Alexander of the National Urban League and the chairman of the Black Caucus said the action was taken because of clear and unmistakable evidence that the purpose of the conference was to legitimize the extermination of the black population. By this time, many other civil rights advocates were beginning to see the same thing. Reverend Benjamin Hooks, one of the future former presidents of the NAACP, once personally told me that the NAACP would not bring this subject to the floor because it, but they believed it would tear up the NAACP. Even the media has conspired with the NAACP to keep this issue from the attention of 
of the black community and the public at large. I have seen the news media literally hide their trucks so that they would not be in a position to have to cover the demonstrations in front of Cobo Hall, only to bring them out after the demonstrators had left. This is an outrage that the black community is having the life of its babies destroyed and the NAACP and the media are knowingly conspiring to keep this information from the public. This is an outrage and it should be dealt with by every fair-minded American. And that sort of thinking is still very much alive today. On January 25th, 2009, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, said on an ABC News program that the government's economic stimulus package should include a large increase in spending for population control. She said that this could save the state and federal governments the cost of having to pay for the health care and education of poor children. Not surprisingly, Pelosi has a 100% approval rating from Planned Parenthood. At one time, it was common to hear politicians and elected officials openly talking about the need for population control in the black community or saying things like uh, $1 spent on family planning is worth $5 spent on economic development. But since we don't hear that sort of thing anymore, it would be easy to conclude that the government is not still involved in black genocide, but that's not the case. Basically, what's happened over the last 40 years or so is that Planned Parenthood has taken billions in government money while locating the vast majority of its facilities in minority neighborhoods. And that has not only been a tremendous boost for the eugenics movement, but it has also allowed government-funded family planning programs to target the black population while insulating the government from any direct connection to black genocide. On the week he was inaugurated, Bill Clinton received this letter from attorney Ron Weddington. Weddington is the ex-husband of Sarah Weddington, the lawyer who successfully argued for the legalization of abortion in the Roe versus Wade case. 26 million food stamp recipients is more than the economy can stand. You can start immediately to eliminate the barely educated, unhealthy and poor segment of our country. No, I'm not advocating some sort of mass extinction of these unfortunate people. Crime, drugs, and disease are already doing that. I am not proposing that you send federal agents armed with Depo Provera dart guns to the ghetto. You should use persuasion rather than coercion. Our survival depends upon our developing a population where everyone contributes. We don't need more cannon fodder. We don't need more parishioners. We don't need more cheap labor. We don't need more poor babies. Two days after being sworn in as president, Bill Clinton issued an executive order that allowed federally funded agencies to refer low-income women for abortions. He also directed that American dollars could be funneled to organizations that promote abortion in foreign countries. The Aid to Families with Dependent Children program is the worst boondoggle ever created. When a sullen black woman of 17 or 18 can decide to have a baby and get welfare and food stamps and become a burden to us all, it's time to stop. Dr. Edward Allred, abortionist, 1980. Edward Allred is the owner of one of the largest chains of abortion clinics in the United States. Not long before Allred made this statement, the Los Angeles Times had reported that his California facilities were handling referrals made by Planned Parenthood. The result is that money has been poured into this organization to the point that Planned Parenthood is now a billion dollar multinational corporation that operates the largest chain of abortion clinics and birth control facilities in America. While much of Planned Parenthood's financial success has been because of donations from these wealthy individuals and large corporations, it has also raked in billions from you and me. In 2006 alone, despite having made over $60 million in profit, Planned Parenthood received about $350 million from the U.S. government. And in 2009, Planned Parenthood will receive approximately $1 million every single day from the American taxpayer. 
That's $1 million every 24 hours. That comes directly out of your paycheck and mine. Now, what you may find interesting is how your money is being spent. To give you just one example, we're going to show you part of a website that Planned Parenthood launched in 2008 called TakeCareDownThere.com. The clip is titled, I Didn't Spew. And I warn you, many of you are going to find it highly offensive. And you're going to find it especially inappropriate for children, despite the fact that is exactly who Planned Parenthood created it for. As you watch this piece, remember, you helped pay for it. Whoa, guy, where's the prophylactic? What do you mean? Look, oral sex is still sex, okay? If it's unprotected, you gotta reject it. What? What? But I didn't even spew. Guys, guys, doesn't matter. Look, if you're having sex or you're getting some blowjays or whatever, you need to use a condom. Because you could catch a sexually transmitted infection, even if you don't spew. What the f*** thing about how Planned Parenthood sees African Americans? You'll have to judge that for yourself. But there's no doubt that if this same video had been made by a bunch of white supremacists or the Ku Klux Klan or some neo-Nazi group, we would all understand the symbolic message behind it. The truth is that if blacks had never been stolen out of Africa and brought here in chains, there would never have been a eugenics movement in the first place. There would never have been forced sterilizations. There would never have been a birth control revolution. There would never have been a call for the legalization of abortion. And you would have never heard the terms population control and family planning. The fact is that had slavery never existed, Planned Parenthood would not exist today. We need to remember that over 60 years ago, a man who could today be called the father of modern day eugenics proposed that population control clinics be concentrated in minority neighborhoods. We need to pay attention to the fact that in the 1960s, when we as African Americans began to demand our civil rights, for the first time in American history, there began a widespread cry in our government for legalized abortion. Was that coincidence too? Or could it be? that when we said we would no longer sit on the back of the bus, a place was being reserved for us down at the abortion. 